Um, the, de the therapeutic misconception, which is very important for people at a randomized controlled trial, says that um, research participants often have, get confused and they mistakenly view the clinical investigator as their personal physician. And they know that their personal physician will take very good care of them. And they can't believe that a research protocol could be very objective and not be responsive to their own medical needs. So they, they feel that um, this therapeutic misconception, they feel that um, they're getting specialized care and they have a specialized physician. Um, but this is really wrong. Um, they believe that um, they are going to be getting the best cutting edge treatment possible. And if you ever hear somebody state, um, I know that I'm getting the best treatment possible because I'm on this experiment. If you hear somebody say that, you know right away they are suffering from the therapeutic misconception. And I don't know if any of you noticed, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but I've said the word treatment, a treatment trial or clinical treatment um, experiment. Anytime you use the word treatment, that has a very positive ring to it. And that is a very misleading term. An experiment is not treatment. Well, there aren't any good answers to any of these questions. So the Nuremberg Code was written in 1949 and was widely accepted by almost all of the nations in the world except the US. Would anyone take a guess at why the US was late in accepting the Nuremberg Code? Talking about voluntary consent. You would guess? Well, if you consider the time, it was like 1950, 51. Do you have a guess? It's hard to say. Yeah, stand up to see it. I think you were saying that there were experiments being conducted in the U.S. that didn't subscribe to the Nuremberg Code. Were you saying something like that? I Yes, you are absolutely right. It's so true. Because what was happening was that the U.S. was actually conducting experiments on children, on unsuspecting adults and on the military, yes. Is, it, is the syphilis treatment one of them? The, the what? The syphilis study. The syphilis, I'm going to get to that. Absolutely right. Correct. Um, so, George Annis believes, he's a, a lawyer ethicist, and he believes that the U.S. was late in adopting the code because of the adamant stand that you know, these experiments must be voluntary and consent must be given by a competent and informed and understanding subjects. And, and as I've just mentioned, subject, there were subjects in experiments that were not um, informed and not understanding. Well, the Declaration of Helsinki, 1964, and that had a very important principle. It said, in research on man, the interests of science or society should never take precedence over the well-being of the subject. So now we get to Tuskegee. Tuskegee, as you know, is one of the most flagrant examples of egregious research that has ever been included. And when um, Beecher wrote a very important article in 1949 describing abuses, he didn't include Tuskegee. Um, and the reason it wasn't included in his expose was because the Tuskegee was still going on. This is very important. The Tuskegee study lasted 40 years, from 1933 to 1973. And it's the longest study ever funded by the U.S. Public Health Service. Many of you I know are very familiar with Tuskegee, but I, I really like to spend a few minutes discussing it because it's so important. And it's had the greatest impact of any research study on the U.S. Um, in fact, I think its impact is still vividly felt. 
Um, first, I want to give you some background on the historical and moral complexities of the study. Um, I think it's important to recognize at the time the disrespect and disregard for humanity of experimental subjects. And that can occur even now, when the quest for knowledge supersedes principles of scientific morality. Now, I'm sure you appreciate the, in the individual as well as the institutionalized racism that was rampant in our country around the turn of the century. Now we're talking about in the 1920s. Um, then appreciate that syphilis is a terrible disease and it affected large segments of the population, especially in the South. An epidemiological study was conducted in the 1920s which identified several pockets of prevalence where syphilis was extremely high. Macon County, Alabama was one of these areas. In Macon County, 35 to 40 percent of the men tested, tested positive for syphilis and 99% of them had never received treatment. Well, at the time, there really wasn't treatment for syphilis, so that wasn't such a big surprise. But they were given, some people were given heavy metals like bismuth, which you could um, rub on the skin to maybe make yourself feel a little better. Well, just around this time, there was a study that was published in Oslo, Norway. And in Oslo, investigators looked at the autopsy reports of thousands of white patients who had died of syphilis. And they documented how syphilis ravaged the body. Now a group of investigators from the U.S. said, hmm, um, there, this, these findings are very intriguing. Um, I wonder if we could repeat them in the U.S. and compare the results, this time looking at untreated syphilis affecting living black men. Okay, so also, Norway looked at white men, and now we're doing an experiment on black men, African Americans. Now, I want to emphasize that at the time, there were many black physicians who were very anxious to prove that this disease affected black and white patients exactly in the same way. They wanted, to, they wanted this experiment because they wanted to prove that blacks and whites were identical in the way they reacted to syphilis, and that syphilis did not differentiate along racial lines. So the end point, like, like uh, Oslo, Norway, would be autopsy. The public health researchers approached the doctor who headed the Memorial Hospital in Tuskegee. This was the foremost Negro hospital in black Alabama, but this hospital was in dire financial straits. So when an offer from the U.S. Public Health Service came around, asking the doctors to collaborate with the study in return for financial support for his hospital, he couldn't resist and had to say yes. So beginning in 1933, 400 indigent black men from Macon County, Alabama, who, were, who had syphilis were recruited into the study. The men were told they had bad blood and the U.S. Public Health Service doctors would give them medical attention. They were never informed of the truth that the design of the natural history study was to merely observe the men and document their illness until the final outcome of his death, and then an autopsy would be performed. And worse yet, they were deceived and exploited. Every year, and this, this Tuskegee study was so remarkable was that this was not done in secret as many other experiments had been done. This was done blatantly. The doctors actually thought they were doing a great thing, great study. And they published their results in, in the leading journals every single year. And every year the doctors came, U.S. Public Health Service doctors came to gather data to see how these men were progressing. And one of the tests that they used were spinal taps. The doctors told the men they were getting back shots. They never revealed that this was just for documentation. 